to the June 12th, 2020 special meeting of the Law and Justice Committee. My name is Gurmai Zahalai and I am the chair of this committee. I would like to thank all of you for being here today. Also, thank you to my colleagues, to the sheriff, to the OLEO director, to the executive and many others for joining us today. Uh, I would also like to thank the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present. We are on their traditional land and we are grateful for them and for the land itself. In light of the COVID-19 pandemic, the governor has issued an emergency order suspending the section of the Open Public Meetings Act that requires we have a physical space for the public to watch our meetings. Initially, this order restricted the briefing topics and legislation the council could consider in a remote setting to those which were necessary and routine or necessary to respond to the COVID-19 outbreak and current public health emergency. In the most recent extension of this order, the necessary and routine restriction has been removed, thus allowing this special meeting to proceed. The purpose of this meeting today is to help us and the public understand the King County Council's relationship with the King County Sheriff's Office, to hear from communities that have imp been impacted by law enforcement, to hear their vision for a path forward, and for us as elected officials to plan the bold steps we're willing to take to ensure that Black Lives Matter. We will also hear from our King County Executive and what he has planned to address issues of justice. One final housekeeping note before getting started, to help us manage the meeting, I'd like us, I'd like to ask the public as well as executive and council staff to please keep your video off until just before you plan to speak. Thank you so much. Clerk, would you please call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member Dembowski? Here. Council Member Dunn? Council Member Cole Wells? Here. Council Member Lambert? Council Member Uptegrove? Here. Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Madam Mr. Clerk. Chair, you have a quorum. Well, also in attendance are Council Members McDermott, Valducci, and Von Reich Bauer. Okay, great. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, may I please have a motion to approve the February 11th and February 25th meeting minutes? Okay. All in favor of adopting and approving these minutes? Aye. Aye. I think the ayes have it. All right. Uh, to set the stage for our discussion, we have Nick Bowman here to give us a brief history of the King County Sheriff's Office, um, who is the top law enforcement officer in King County, and then a general outline of the council's authorities in relation to the Sheriff's Office. Mr. Bowman, the line is yours. Good morning, council members. Okay, I have. Are we ready? Okay. Good morning, council members. Uh, for the record, Nick Bowman, council central staff. Uh, before the meeting really gets going, the chair asked that I provide a general outline of the council's authorities as they relate to the sheriff's office. And uh, to begin with, I thought that would be helpful uh, for the committee to hear a brief history of the sheriff in King County. From 1852 to 1969, the King County Sheriff was an elected position that operated more or less independently of the three county commissioners who exercised both legislative and executive power. During this time, the Sheriff, along with other elected county officials, including the assessor, auditor, clerk, coroner, prosecuting attorney, and treasurer, had considerable discretion over the operations of their departments without much oversight from, by the commissioners. With the adoption of Amendment 21 to the state constitution in 1948, counties in Washington state were able to adopt home rule charters with voter approval. After rejecting an initial charter in 1952, the voters of King County approved a home rule charter in November 1968. The charter replaced many elected officials, including the sheriff, with appointed positions subordinate to the executive. For the next 25 years, the top law enforcement officer in King County was appointed by the executive as the Director of Public Safety, which is what the Sheriff's Office was renamed under the 1968 Charter. In May 1996, Proposed Ordinance 95755 was adopted by the County Council, which submitted to the voters a charter amendment to establish the County Sheriff as a nonpartisan elected official with a four-year term. The ordinance maintained the Department of Public Safety as an executive department and also maintained the civil service employment status of the department's employees. 
In November 1966, the, or sorry, in November 1996, the, the voters of King County approved Charter Amendment Number 2, making the county sheriff a nonpartisan elected official with 57% of the vote, yes. In November 1997, Dave Reichert, a veteran of the King County Police Force, was elected sheriff. Since, sheriff's Reich, since Sheriff Reichert's first term in 1998, there have been a total of five elected county sheriffs. With that brief bit of history, I will now move on to the general authorities of the council in relation to the King County Sheriff's Office. Under the county charters section 3502040, the sheriff is the administrative head of the Department of Public Safety, whose duties are directed by general law found in RCW chapter 36.28. Under the same charter section, the Department of Public Safety is declared to be an executive department subject to the county's personnel system which shall not be abolished or combined with any other executive department or administrative office and shall not have its duties decreased by the county council. From the powers granted to the sheriff by the charter, the council can generally influence KCSO's policies and operations in the following ways. First, the council can propose amendments to the county charter relating to the sheriff and the Department of Public Safety, which must be approved by the voters. However, depending on the amendment, voter approval may not in itself be sufficient to effectuate the desired change. If the charter amendment would affect working conditions of the unionized workforce, in such case, the county would most likely need to engage in bargaining with the affected unions. Second, provided the legislation is not in direct conflict with the general laws provided in RCW chapter 36.28 and does not decrease the duties of the sheriff as prohibited by the charter, the council can adopt legislation related to the sheriff's office practices and or require changes to those practices and procedures. However, the legal validity of any such legislation must be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. And like with charter amendments, adoption of an ordinance may not in itself be sufficient to effectuate the desired change if the legislation would affect working conditions of the unionized workforce. Third, the council approves or rejects KCSO, KCSO labor agreements. The council also sets labor policies for the county. The Department of Public Safety is an executive department and its employees are subject to the county personnel system. As such, the council sets labor policies to guide the collective bargaining negotiations for the unionized workforce in KCSO. For such employees that by charter, the sheriff is the county's bargaining agent for all bargaining matters except wages and benefits. For wages and benefits, the executive is the bargaining agent with uh, the Office of Labor Relations fulfilling that responsibility. Finally, the council sets funding levels for KCSO by budget appropriations and may impose restrictions on such appropriations by expenditure restrictions or provisos. And just as a reminder for the listening public, the county operates under a biennial budget which originates from the executive and then is transmitted to the council for amendment and final approval. Uh, that concludes my remarks. On the line for the discussion today is Sheriff Joe Hegniff and Chief Cole Tyndall, OLEO Director Deborah Jacobs, and council's legal counsel. With that, I will toss it back to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you're still muted. I don't think we're ever gonna get past that as a learning lesson. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Bowman, really appreciate it. Uh, we'll pause there for a moment and before we have the broader discussion, on law enforcement and justice. I would like to first move into public comment. Madam Clerk, do we have anyone on the line wishing to provide public comment? Yes, we do, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. So having an entirely remote meeting is an unusual thing for King County Council. And I wanna be sure that everyone who has called in understands the rules for public comment and how the process will be managed. First, some ground rules. Public comment must be related to items on today's meeting agenda and not be used for the purpose of assisting a campaign for election of any person to any office or for the promotion of, promotion of or opposition to any ballot proposition. It must also not include obscene speech. If a speaker fails to abide by these restrictions, I will rule the speaker out of order and require the speaker to exit the virtual meeting. Now I will describe the process as all members of the public joined the meeting, they were automatically muted. I can see your name or last three digits of your phone number. Our committee clerk will call the names and numbers. When your name or last three digits of your phone number is called, staff will unmute your line. 
please make sure to also unmute your own phone if you have uh, muted yourself as a courtesy. Before you begin your testimony, please wait to be acknowledged to be sure we can hear you and then start by saying and telling us your name so we can capture it accurately for the record. And by telling us your name, I mean spelling your name so we can accurately capture it for the record. If you wish for your video to be turned on for your public comment, please request this before beginning. You will have two minutes when you have reached You can finish your thought, but please wrap up your comments to allow the next person to speak. If you go past two minutes, you may be muted. If you are listening on the TV or streaming, please turn that function off. Otherwise, we will hear feedback on the line. If you are disruptive to the meeting, I will ask staff to hang up the call so you leave the meeting. Please hang up after you have provided your comment to make it easier for us to manage the call. You can follow the remainder of the meeting on King County TV, Channel 22, or stream it online. The link to stream online is on the council's website at kingcounty.gov slash council and click on the watch us live button. We will now begin the public comment period. As a reminder, please wait to be acknowledged to be sure we can hear you. Madam Clerk, please go ahead and begin calling names and numbers for public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The first caller is Beth Dunbar. Please proceed. I have tried to unmute on my end and you might need to unmute on your end. Please proceed. Thank you, I have no public comment. I'll pass the mic. Thank you so much. Thank next, the next person I have on the list is Brooke Butner. Please go ahead, you are unmuted. Hello, my name is Brooke Bittner. That's B-R-O-O-K-B-U-E-T-N-E-R. I managed the North Sound Radar, which is response de-escalation and referral. Radar operates in five North County cities, Shoreline, Forest Park, Bothell, Kenmore, and Kirkland, and offers outreach-based social services to people who have come in contact with law enforcement. I wanted to make public comment today to offer this model as uh, for consideration because it has been so successful in North King County. Uh, I wanna thank the council and specifically council member Dembowski who has championed this alternative approach and the King County Mid Behavioral Health Tax Levy which funds this program. The police chiefs in all five of the radar cities here in North County have shown a deep commitment over the last few years to meeting people's basic and behavioral health needs and keeping them out of the criminal legal system. Each of these five chiefs has expressed to me that they are now hearing the demands of their community to move toward alternative approaches to meeting people's needs and avoiding police involvement. In early evaluation, the radar model, which sends social workers out to individuals that the police have contacted who have behavioral health needs, the model has shown reduction in use of force and hundreds of individuals in our communities have been tied into services. I'm excited for the opportunities this social movement presents. We in North County are excited to continue to build on the infrastructure supported by King County and by MID to continue to move toward meeting people's needs in their community before law enforcement or the criminal legal system becomes necessary. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. The next caller is uh, listed as collective justice. Go ahead, you are unmuted. If you do not wish to speak, just oh. let me know. I'm not, I'm from Collective Justice, but I'm actually speaking um, from, as Davida Briscoe. Oh, as, great, thank you. So I'm not sure if that's the same one. It, I think it is. Can you okay. spell your name, please? It's Davida, D-E-V-I-T-T-A, last name Briscoe, B-R-I-S-C-O-E. Thank you, go ahead. I am... Uh, the sister of Shay Taylor, my brother was killed by um, two Seattle police officers in um, Seattle on February 16, 2016. Uh, my family and I went through the inquest 
process, which took over a year. Um, and that experience was deeply dehumanizing um, to my family, to um, just the whole process was, um, it felt like it was one-sided, it was unfair, it wasn't transparent. Uh, the community didn't understand the interrogatories um, it was just a deeply confusing process. Um, I worked with, I was appointed by Dal Constantine to, I was a part of the committee um, along with Rick, um, John T. Williams' brother, Rick Williams, and a few others. We worked extremely hard to get community engaged, to implement, to work on some reforms that would make it a more transparent and fair process. Uh, that took a considerable amount of time that I was not compensated for that time, but I was deeply engaged in that work because of my personal experience. And I wanted to make this process more fair for other families. And it would just be devastating to the community, to the committee, to a lot of people who have pushed for these reforms. Um, Sonia, who is Giovanni McDade's mother, who boycotted her own inquest hearing because she was not given time from her lawyer to prepare. Um, they were going to proceed without her. And it was, these were some of the, the reasons why we pushed for these reforms and to go backwards would be devastating. Um, we need to build on what we have already done to repair the trust between the community and the police and um, the lawsuits by the sheriff Renton, Kent, um, Auburn, and especially Officer time. Jeff Lawson. My time is up? Or? Uh, yes, that was the timer. Davida, if you wouldn't mind just wrapping up really quickly, that would be great. Okay. I just think uh, the Officer Jeff Nelson, that definitely needs to be addressed. Um, three deadly force incidents within nine years and 65 excessive force complaints is ridiculous. Um, and we have to move forward with building that trust between the community again and getting and, and pushing for the reforms that we have already implemented. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. The next person on the line is Elaine Simons. Please go ahead. You are unmuted. Um, I would like to show my video. Can I go live? Hello? Yes, please. Why not? Um, it won't let. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elaine Simons. Um, I'm currently a foster high school art teacher, and I'm also the former executive director of Peace for the Streets by Kids from the Streets. Today, I'm talking on behalf of Jesse Saray, who was the third person that was executed by Officer Jeff Nelson on May 31st, 2019. Jesse Saray was my foster son. And um, that fateful morning when I got the phone call from his brother saying, Elaine, have you been watching the news? And I said, yes, um, don't tell me it was one of um, our family members. And that's when I learned it was Jesse Saray who was executed. One of my biggest concerns about what is happening on this case was the fact that a law was passed where mental health responders are supposed to be called when there is a, a parent agitated or someone who seems to be having a mental health breakdown. This did not happen for Jesse. So Jesse was sitting alone eating ice chips in front of an ice uh, machine in Auburn, Washington, when Officer Nelson approached him. What escalated from that to me was a for, uh, was unjustified execution of my son. I believe what happened was could have been a preventable. After the first shot, I'm not a medical examiner, but I believe Jesse could have survived. However, Officer Nesson took the gun and did the faithful execution of shooting my foster son in the head. My son was down. He hadn't. He was already not able to fight back. What I am seeing in light of George Floyd's death is that we are bringing to light the unjustified murders of black, brown, and Native American bodies in this country. 
And I am really tired of seeing that these police officers who are, I know police officers, I, I don't, I'm not gonna go on that platform, but I have worked with police officers in the donut dialogues. And we have worked very hard in creating, um, okay, I'll wrap it up. Um, Thank you, I just wanna let you know that Jesse should be the last death of Officer Nelson. Please do not let anyone else be killed by this officer. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your comments. The next caller is uh, Joseph Shoji Lachman. Go ahead, please, you're unmuted. Morning, council members. Thank you um, for the opportunity to provide public comment. Um, so again, I'll say my name is uh, Joseph, J-O-S-E-P-H, Shoji, S-H-O-J-I, Lachman, L-A-C-H-M-A-N. And I am the policy analyst for Asian Counseling Referral Service. Um, I'm here today actually to speak um, in strong support of the, um, the county's inquest process and um, to speak to the letter that we recently helped circulate, which now has close to 4,200 um, sign-ons from various um, organizations, individuals, including um, close to 70 organizations at this point in the King County area, uh, supporting um, the inquest process and opposing um, lawsuits by um, cities of Seattle, Auburn, Federal Way, Rent, um, Renton, Kent, and also the Sheriff's Office um, that's attempting to dismantle um, the inquest process. Um, we're highly concerned that this is um, an injustice to black communities everywhere and other communities that are dealing with police violence. Um, also as a, an organization that works with the Pacific Islander community, uh, we've seen how um, the actions of officers such as uh, Officer Nelson have impacted our community members, including um, execution and the killing of um, Isaiah Obet, who's a member of the Pacific Islander community. And um, so our demands really as a, as a coalition are that um, the King County Sheriff's Office, among the others, drop its lawsuit that seeks to destroy the inquest process. And what we'd really like to see is the King County Executive and Sheriff uh, let the inquest jury offer its opinion as to whether officers uh, committed a crime in killings of Charlena Lyles and Isaiah Obet um, in line with the family's um, wishes as they've um, conveyed to us. Um, we want to also, of course, thank the King County Executive's Office for working with various community organizations to strengthen the inquest process. And I'd also like to thank um, Councilmember Colwells for um, her response to the letter, um, the first to respond to it and um, show support um, for upholding the inquest process. Um, and with that, um, I, I'd just like to close uh, by uh, expressing how important it is that uh, County Council and the City Councils and the Sheriff's Office listen to the voices of community with just under uh, 48 hours, you know, collecting over uh, 4,000 signatures. I think it's shown a strong uh, community voice that says that we need to uphold uh, police accountability, especially uh, in these times, as we've seen Time. around the country, demanding justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you um, the next person is Katrina Johnson. Go ahead, please. You're unmuted. Good morning. Um, my name is Katrina Johnson, K-A-T-R-I-N-A -A Johnson, J-O-H-N-S-O-N. I am the cousin um, of Charlena Lyles. Um, Charlene Lyles was killed June 18, 2017, and it'll be three years next Thursday for our family, and we still have no answers as to what happened to my cousin. Why did she have to die? And the only way we're going to get those answers is through an inquest process that has been held up. And so I'm asking the King County Sheriff's Office to drop their lawsuit that seeks to destroy the, in, uh, the King County inquest process. And similarly to um, the King County Sheriff's Department, I'm asking the city of Auburn, Kent, Renton, and Federal Way to drop their lawsuits as well. I'm also asking the King County Executive and the Sheriff um, to let the inquest jury offer its opinion as to whether officers 
um, committed a crime in the killing of my cousin, Charlena Lyles, and also Isaiah Obed. It is time for us to do a paradigm shift. And the only way that is going to happen is for folks to stop upholding systems that are not working for people who have lost their loved ones and begin to do something different. And I need for these, these entities who want to continue to um, do the same thing and business as usual to stop. And uh, I want you guys to not allow them to do that so that families can get answers, so that we can have reform, so that we can pave a way so that folks will stop dying and people can start to be held accountable for the things that they are doing. Thank you. Thank you. The next person is listed as Legal Team Zoom. If that is you, please unmute yourself and go ahead. And start. Um, it's, that's me. Hi, this is Corey Gilmat. Um, I'm going to um, uh, decline public comment. My, I am the attorney for the family of Charlene Lyles, and um, my client Katrina Johnson said anything I would say better than I could say it myself. Thank you very much. The next person is Michaela Wright. Go ahead, you are unmuted. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to the council um, and I'll go ahead and get started. So my name is Michaela Wright and I am an MSW intern with the Black Trans Task Force. I also use they, them pronouns. I've experienced health systems on three separate occasions and I know I'm not the only non-binary or trans person to experience this or state violence. Housing would help my community by uniting us. For too long, we've been policed and we've been pushed away from our homes. We've been gentrified out. We worry daily about our safety and that I'd be funding the police by at least 50% and reinvesting in our community would help a lot. Minneapolis has started this process. They occupied a hotel and housed homeless folks. They sheltered protesters from police. They were able to hold community meetings. They fed one another and they cared for their needs. Our communities know how to take care of one another when we're given the resources that we need. In our very own Kent, there is a motel that has been used to house COVID-19 patients. Why can't the council or other um, elected officials donate this motel to us and defund the police and invest in support for trans people of color, specifically black trans people? We don't deserve to have to worry constantly about our housing and our safety. And yesterday we found out that two black trans women, Dominique Remy Fells of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Raya Milton of Liberty Township, Ohio, had been murdered. We mourned their deaths and we want to see an end to the violence that black trans women experience. State violence and trans misogyny are deadly. Our community needs safety and housing, not over-policing. Please support us and invest in us. Thank you for this time. And um, yeah, that's the end of my comment. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you. Um, the next person is Nikita Oliver. Go ahead, please. You are unmuted. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, King County Council members. Uh, I wanna speak directly to first the inquest process. Um, Katrina Johnson touched on it. The first is there's a number of uh, police groups that have filed writs on the case as it relates to the inquest reform process that community did. There are three key things that I think need to be addressed here. Um, the first is about families having access to uh, evidence and having the opportunity to fully see the case related to the murder of their want loved one fully represented. The second is um, many of the police departments are fighting against officers that have knowledge of a shooting having to testify. And so not believing those officers should be subpoenaed. And the third part of this inquest process is making sure that the inquest jury actually gets to make a de determination around criminal means. These are really important parts of the inquest process that we're seeing many police departments in King County pushing back against as we're, we're dealing with this suit. And they're important pieces because when it relates to police reform, they are a part of restoring some amount of a trusted relationship between the system and communities most impacted by police brutality. Um, I, I acknowledge that the reform process is incredibly important. I also wanna say that ultimately what we need to get to is addressing defunding police departments in our county, including the King County Sheriff. 
and finding ways to reinvest those dollars in community-based public health and public safety strategies. Uh, policing doesn't keep our community safer, and inquests really only give us information, fact-finding, about whether or not uh, that office related policy. And while that is significant and important, I think our county needs to start making um, significant strides towards eliminating the possibility of state-sanctioned violence and police brutality against Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So I hope that as you consider these comments, you encourage police departments to drop their writs in the suit, but that also as a council, you think seriously about the possibility of fully divesting from this really traumatizing and oppressive system. Thank you, Nikita. Thank you. The next person on the line is Randy. Please go ahead. You are muted. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Can you please state your name and uh, your full name? Perfect. My name is Randy Ford, R-A-N-D-Y-F-O-R-D. I use she, her, goddess as pronouns. I am a representative from the Washington Black Parents Task Force. And I am here to, uh, we uh, our task force, the Lavender Rights Project that provides direct services um, to Black trans folks. And we are working on a housing initiative. Um, housing is one of the most vital needs all people share. Transgender people face family rejection, lower employment rates, and other risk factors, which all can lead to housing instability and higher rates of homelessness. For transgender people who experience homelessness, shelters present additional problems and often are unsafe environments. During the 2015 United States Transgender Survey, 1,667 Washington State transgender residents identified the following housing-related experiences. 26% experience some form of housing discrimination, such as being evicted from their home or denied a home or apartment because of being transgender. 30%, 37% have experienced homelessness at some point in their lives. 13% experienced homelessness in the past year because of being transgender. 33% have avoided staying in a shelter because they feared being mistreated as a transgender person. Transgender people like myself deserve housing. We are asking the King County Council to do the following. Cut police funding in half. Use those funds to invest in transitional housing and community supports for transgender people of color in King County, specifically black trans people. Donate the Kent Motel that was purchased for COVID-19 to the black trans task force and other trans specific groups of color. Thank you for your time. Thank you for Thank your you, comments. The next, the next person is Rosa Mai. Go ahead, you are unmuted. I'm trying to unmute you, Rosa Mai, but it's not working on my end. Maybe you need to unmute. I will try, I'll move on and try to come back to Rosa later. The next person is Sean Good. I'm trying, I'm also trying to unmute Sean and that's not working on my end. Oh, there you go. There you go. I'd like to the camera, please. Good morning, everyone. Sean Good, S-E-A-N-G-O-O-D-E. -O -O -E. I steward Choose 180 as our executive director. I am overjoyed that our director of public health, Patty Hayes, declared racism a public health issue. And as Black people in our community are suffering from two consecutive pandemics, both COVID-19 and racism, I believe it's imperative that our county lean in with the same breadth of resources that they use to combat COVID-19 to combat the disease of racism and intentionally divest from the very things that are perpetuating the spread of the disease, the institutions that lift up and uphold systemic racism. 
Um, today, we can talk about law enforcement explicitly. I have a long history of partnering intentionally with law enforcement to de-escalate tensions in community to support young people who are often marginalized and pushed to the fringes, particularly in South County. Um, I've had great working relationships with law enforcement. And, and the fact that I needed to exist in those spaces in partnership with law enforcement spoke to the divide that existed between community and those that are there to protect and serve the community. When we continue to resource additives to something that is dysfunctional, we're, we're only pouring more money into a house that's, that's desperately falling apart. Um, if you were building, if you had a home and you realized it was caked full of black mold, at a certain point you'd realize that it made more sense to tear the house down and rebuild an alternative than it would to continue to support the house with the black mold. Well, quite frankly, the black community is suffocating in a house that's been created with black mold. And we have been dying for years, whether it's been death by homicide, death by assassination, whether it's been death through incarceration and drug addiction, the socioeconomic conditions that have continued to have been policed and not treated have left us in quite the desperate situation. And as a result, I am petitioning the county council to please begin to divest from systemic racism, invest in alternatives, and let us collaboratively tear down this house of racism Thanks. and build up an alternative. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. The next person on the line is Sophia Perez. I'm trying to unmute you. If you'd like to speak, please try to mute yourself and speak. Or if you could just let us know you would not like to speak. I will come back to Sophia Perez at a later time. Uh, the next person I have is Sidnor, S-Y-D-N-O-R. Go ahead, please, you are muted. Hi, thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Sidnor, as you said, S-Y-D-N-O-R, Fauzi, F as in Frank, A-W-Z-I. Good morning, Council. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm here today as a concerned citizen of King County to respectfully demand that the King County Sheriff's Office make radical changes to their policing in the service of public health and safety, and to ask the Council to support divestment of this system. I would like to speak specifically to the current sections of the general orders manual that broadly defines the necessary use of deadly force hinging on a member's belief in an Im imminent threat to their safety. What we have seen over and over again in cases involving the murder of black, brown and indigenous people is that this belief need not be backed by facts, but by mere feeling. People should not die because of an officer's feelings. And here's why. I'm a trained psychologist. I've also been socialized in the white racial category. What I've learned in this process of my own recovery from internalized racial superiority is that our social systems and institutions have indoctrinated us into believing that there is reality to the claims of difference among races. This is a lie. I was taught to fear brown and black people. I was taught that black people as a group are inherently dangerous and violent. This is one of the biggest lies. I was taught that as a white liberal, that my intelligence and my deep belief that everyone is valuable would somehow offer me immunity to this unconscious training in racism. Another huge lie. This one I told myself, to myself. These lies are perpetuated not only by our larger social system, but are reinforced by the violent, arrogant, and stubbornly arrogant, ignorant behavior of our current police force. We are taught to look at the surface when we need to be looking deeper. Brown and black people are not inherently violent or dangerous. That is a distorted expectation forced upon them by our social system. When I read the cases of Tommy Lee, a young man carelessly shot in the back holding a pen, or of the boy My Chance Dunlap Giddens shot in the back of the head during a pathetically executed sting operation, I see officers who are emotionally out of control and who are backed by a system that enables and perpetuates their unrecognized fear and trauma. Often the conversation with these types of cases are around good cops and bad cops. There should be no bad cops with guns in our society, period. 
You have a duty to protect not only the lives of our citizens who pay your salaries, you have a duty to protect the mental health and integrity of our police force. You must stop enabling immoral and violent behavior in any form. You must take perpetrator trauma seriously, and you must reward ethical and moral behavior, like cops that stop other cops from committing violence against human beings. We cannot escape unconscious bias. We all have it. But when coupled with institutional power and white privilege in this country, it is dangerous and lethal to us all. We, the people, cannot continue to give the power of taking another person's life to a police officer and not also subject that police officer and the system they work in to thorough scrutiny and more importantly, accountability under the law. This will not continue. With great power must come great accountability. Thank you. Thank you. The next person on the line is Tony Folan. I'm trying to unmute you. There you go. Hello. Go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Tony Folan, and I'm a prop school counselor and volunteer coach at Franklin High School. I'm also a Seattle Public School alum. I'm a supporter of King County Youth in various capacities over a decade now. And um, I've supported up uh, in the north end at Nathan Hale and Ingram High School, as well on the west side and south end areas of King County um, in a nonprofit sector, uh, supporting schools such as West Seattle, Chief South, Garfield, Roosevelt, Lindbergh, Hazen, Highline, and Mount Rainier High School. With those experiences, I can honestly tell you that the students and the communities that feel safer and yield higher academic success are the ones that have the means and resources to intentionally and strategically invest in the communities they directly serve. For us at Franklin High School, we have over 90% students of color and a free and reduced lunch population of 70%, which is grossly inaccurate due to stigmatization. And as a result, our family engagement and our PTSA funding, which typically is used at other schools to help supplement school costs, aren't as high. Uh, which means that we operate with less and expected to perform the same. Uh, however, even with those barriers, students at our school have a higher admittance rate than any other school in the Seattle public um, at UW Seattle. Uh, and that's really attributed to the resourcefulness of the students, the staff, the school, and, and our community. And it has me wonder, what if we didn't have to make a dollar out of 15 cents? What if we actually got the funding we needed? What could we actually accomplish? And regarding the safety of our black and brown students, they're regularly navigating unsafe areas and experience trauma of gun violence daily. Franklin High School and South End students have been directly impacted and have been even victims to gun violence. Chief Best in her annual report explained that gun violence in the South End area has risen from last year. And as a result, our school and many schools in the South End have prioritized safety as it has become much more paramount. That said, increasing police presence isn't the answer. More policing and more guns isn't going to help our students feel safer. It won't remedy the problem. That's why in Investing in a community and its members, such as the Blue Coats with SYVPI, is what I propose. Regardless of the issues and what Seattle uh, police intentions are, when you have more police presence arresting and policing the people in your community who look like you, you inherently believe you are bad and that you're in a bad neighborhood too. If you acknowledge and, and respond to adverse negative behavior, it doesn't foster community or safety, but it breeds and perpetuates fear and distrust. And honestly, the same holds true in teaching and education. We do not want to to reward or acknowledge negative behavior. If we allocate funding for SVD to education, we could strategically and intentionally add preventative resources and supports in the fields of mental health, safety, and teaching, such as safe passageway in the South End to support students to and from school while strengthening school, community, and family relationships engagement. We can facilitate uh -huh. mandate restorative justice and practices training for all staff members. We can have a comprehensive cultural responsive trainings and, and more so, uh, workshops on a, on a monthly basis to support the students um, and then collaborate with CBOs and have stronger cultural understanding uh, with our students and partner with programs such as ACRS, REWA, and ACES. Overall, investing in our education system looks like having education be relevant to the students that we serve. Leading with a strengths-based approach that's assets-based rather than Tony, deficit. Please, please wrap up, Tony. Thank you so much. We need to be intentional and we need to be systematic. We need to rework the foundation and encompass the students that we identify and that we know need support. We need to restructure our curriculum. We need to mandate it rather than make it an elective. We need to emphasize that this is essential and that's what it means to invest in public safety and our youth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. Thank you. 
The next person um, has come in with the last three digits of their phone number as 613. Go ahead, please. Can you state your name and spell it? This person has area code 206, and then the last three digits are 613. Go ahead, you are unmuted. Would you like to speak? Madam Clerk, how many more people do we have on the line? Is it a, a lot more? Um, I have five that are still waiting to speak and then a couple others that I was planning on going back to. Okay, Would you like me to proceed? Yeah, let's proceed with just a, a couple more and then uh, we can go to the next item on our agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The next person on the line it has the last three digits of 613. If you'd like to speak, please state your name and spell it. Oh, I already did that one, sorry. How about the next one is three digits, 700. Please go ahead, you are muted. Can you say and spell your name? Last three digits, 700 of your phone number. You are unmuted. I'll move on. The next person has the last three digits of 885. You now are unmuted. Please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Can you state your, spell your name, please, and then go ahead. My name is Pauli Giulianotti. That's G-I-U-G-L-I-A-N-O-T-T-I. I'm uh, calling on behalf, uh, on behalf of Next Steps Washington, founded by Annalise and Fred Thomas, parents of the late Leonard Thomas. Next Steps supports giving Olio subpoena power and generally expanding Olio oversight power. We understand the restrictions and how uh, this must be bargained with KCSO. Uh, and so that makes it a long-term goal, and I urge you to fight for its inclusion in the CBA. Um, I also urge you to focus on things that can go into effect right away, Specifically, many KCSO policies might be less difficult to change and could be uh, in effect immediately. Olio has highlighted many of these changes based off of specific cases and people who were lost unnecessarily, like Tommy Lay, My Chance Dunlap Ginz, and Renee Davis. This includes, uh, so please take a look at the policies and procedures of the KCSO, specifically use of force, excessive use of force, chases, both vehicular and pedestrian, carotid and neck restraints, de-escalation training to be on par or greater in length than training on the shooting range, requiring tasers at all times, mental health professionals who are specially trained to respond when a call comes in about someone uh, with a mental health crisis or a psychosis is, is suspected, and the list goes on. And I, what I'm trying to get across is that you should throw out the policy manual and start over. Finally, council members, I urge you to use your political weight to advocate for reforms on the state level in regards to police unions and collective bargaining, which is the most severe, severe hindrance to change. Money is negotiable. Accountability and oversight should not be. Thank you, council members. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I've tried to call on everyone on the list at least once. I'm getting and, a message um, from my staff that uh, the number 613 might be wanting to speak again if you want to try them one more time. Okay, six. Hi. Hi, this is Dominic Davis from Community Passageways. Um, I apologize for missing my, um, when you were calling me. Uh, I wanted to touch base on the, uh, the defunding issue and uh, reallocating funds out of SPD into the community. We were able to pull off a uh, major event in South Seattle on Sunday with a whole collaboration, a team of organizations and, and community members. And um, I had a, 
made it clear to SPD that we won't need their presence in this march that we're doing because uh, we're going to secure and protect our own community. And they said, okay, cool. They agreed to and let us do this. And we were very successful at pulling that off in the collaboration of different community-based organizations and community members coming together, working together to put together a really tight security system um, of folks um, manning stations and blocking off streets and leading from the front and the back and the sides. And it was really powerful thing to see. And so in that, in that um, um, march, there was about 10,000 plus people there. And when all these people came and showed up, one of the things that was amazing that we kept hearing over and over again is how organized and how structured everything was. So nothing happened, no incidents happened, nothing jumped off, everything was safe, everything was well protected. And then at the end of the march, because community got to see community standing up and guarding and protecting and securing community, community came together in a peaceful way community was around each other in a very structured, um, orderly way. A lot of young people who um, were rival gangs, I guess you could say, reached out to me the next, over the next few days and said, hey, you know, we want to talk about a truce. They, so now here we are talking about doing a truce summit, all coming out of the fact that they think community come together and work together in unison to protect its own self. Funding needs to be put into community-based organizations and operations so we can start building our own way of protecting and securing our own community. It shows other people in the community that, that we can, it shows everybody we can do that. It shows SPD we can do that. It shows show you guys we can do that. And then when we do that, it brings unity and it brings community together okay. when they see us doing it together. Thank you so much, Dominique. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for giving public comment. We really appreciate that. Um, and the last person we'll hear from as part of public comment is our King County Executive, Dow Constantine. Executive Constantine, are you on the line? I am. Good morning. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Since uh, you waited till the end, we will afford you a little bit longer than two minutes. Thank uh, you. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Executive, please go ahead. Thank you. Well, uh, greetings and welcome to the statewide day of action. Uh, and thank you for providing me a few minutes to talk about our work. I also want to acknowledge the pain and grief and anger and frustration being felt in this community as we continue to wrestle with institutional racism in the United States of America. And I want to share my commitment to action and accountability and to doing the hard work of listening and reflecting and disrupting business as usual and to showing up the way we all need to for everyone and especially uh, our colleagues, our Black King County government colleagues and their families who are struggling at this moment. And I also want to Thank uh, Council Chair Balducci for suggesting, uh, as I was ranting at her, that I share my thoughts with the council and uh, to Chair Zahalai for inviting me to do so here today. And I think we share values and we share goals, and I commit to working with uh, all of the leaders on this call to accomplish those goals. Now, first, this week, we've focused on stating clearly and with conviction that racism is a public health crisis. Uh, public Health Director Patty Hayes and I met over the weekend with several leaders within the Black community, and, uh, and uh, we were asked to convene this conversation, and, and everyone in that meeting agreed that a mere statement would be hollow, that it needed to be accompanied with real actions and of course that a public health declaration was not going to be the thing that uh, that solved 400 years of uh, white supremacy, but it was something where we could in fact make some tangible progress in specific areas, particularly those that are driven by a public health approach. And I intend to do that convening under the guidance and leadership of those and other community leaders uh, and King County employees in public health who do this work. And we must all recognize that historically and right now, 
King County, like all governments and virtually every institution in our society has been complicit in maintaining and perpetuating structural racism. And as an institution, we must then be a vital player in dismantling oppressive systems that are grounded in centuries of white supremacy. We will share power and resources and work on community-defined problems using community-driven solutions co-created by people most negatively affected by racism. Community-driven solutions are uh, going to be central to our policy work, our budget work, our programmatic work, as we commit to convening other jurisdictions and other agencies across sectors and establishing a shared measurable accountability. Community leaders and organizations will be provided resources as well to co-create solutions. Uh, we know this is critical that we cannot continue to call upon people to do this work of remaking our community and our society without the resources to, to support that work. And so we're going to ensure that that happens and we will make these commitments because we know that together we can in fact lay the foundation for a better, stronger community. So second, I'm working to center the experience of uh, our black leaders uh, within government and within the community in my decision-making as we identify some of the work that can be done right now within our own system. So thus far, I have heard that we must reinvent community safety and that call has come in many ways to demilitarize policing or defund the police departments uh, and to reinvest in community. If we're going to transform the way our county views public safety, we have to divest from old systems that aren't working. And uh, as importantly, we have to reinvest in black, indigenous, and people of color. Communities have been the most harmed by systems rooted in oppression. Now, I've instructed my team to review the budget and to do so with an anti-racist lens guided by input heard from community and I received my first preliminary briefing on that budget work yesterday. And I can tell you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, there are already, we were already seeing some exciting opportunities uh, that I look forward to working with all the council members on. And King County must drive resources to where they're needed uh, as indicated by those in community. And as we move into recovery from the pandemic, I would remind you that we can't allow the same thing to happen that happened in 2009 when, uh, when black and brown communities, black and brown households were systematically stripped of what wealth they had by the economic forces taking place and there was not an appropriate safety net provided to help them recover as others were able to successfully recover. Uh, Moving towards the end of my remarks on transparency and accountability. Uh, while we began the arduous but long overdue task of building an anti-racist community safety model, we have to ensure that there are measures put in place to more immediately uh, prevent further harm. I plan to lead the charge to exempt civilian oversight uh, from uh, the restrictions that we have uh, been, been struggling with since we created the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight in, uh, in, when I was on the county council. And it has been a long, frustrating process to try to get that office the authority to provide real, genuine oversight that can illuminate not just what happened in a particular uh, uh, tragedy, but also um, what can be changed about uh, training and equipping and, 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 and mandating uh, the use of police authority so that we can de-escalate the violence in our communities. We need accountability measures for, for use of force policies. Um, and we need uh, to make sure as well, and I'll touch on this in a second, that the inquest process is allowed to move forward because we redesigned it with community, in fact, with families of those who've died to be able to get to the bottom of what was wrong, not just with the individual officer, but with the entire system within which they're operating so that those agencies 
could be made to change the way they approach policing. Um, and in the criminal legal system and detention reforms, we must review the landscape of criminal legal policy to eliminate policies that perpetuate uh, the very things that we're trying to end, structural racism uh, and inequity. And COVID-19 has allowed us to think creatively, has created a path to go further than we ever have been able to before to reduce populations in our detention facilities. And I want to signal this right now to the council and to all of the many players in the criminal legal system, including uh, our own agencies. We are going to work together to make this reduced population, these changes permanent. And we have to commit ourselves to that effort and then to reducing the amount of spending uh, that goes into the detention function so it can be reprogrammed into the things that are going to help people actually resolve problems in their lives and in communities and live a more successful life and avoid the constant addition of grief and cost through the criminal legal system. And along those lines in youth detention, we are continuing the arduous march toward zero youth detention. Uh, when I took office, uh, the average daily population was 84 youth in detention. I want to tell you some good news, which is this week we reached what I believe is a new record low of a census of 28. Uh, and we are getting there through a number of different uh, methods, including booking restrictions, including working with the courts and the prosecutor and the defense to figure out how to have more young people who've been charged with a crime at home uh, or on electronic home monitoring rather than detention. And these are not uh, easy changes to make in a system uh, that is uh, as broad and with so many power centers as the one we have. But together, I think we are accomplishing what we set out to accomplish and marching toward that day when we can genuinely uh, claim to have uh, accomplished our goal and arrived at zero youth detention. And we, as I mentioned, need to be able to follow through and hold the inquest that we designed with the community. Uh, it's been more than two years now. And uh, I wanna thank everyone who testified today in support of our new community created system. And I particularly wanna thank Seattle City Attorney Pete Holmes for dismissing the city's lawsuit that sought to prevent us from moving forward. So Mr. Chair, in conclusion, it is time for us to reimagine policing and more to the point, reimagine what it looks like to create safe communities and reimagine more broadly the criminal legal system and more broadly than that, all the systems in our society. And these are only samples of the actions that are needed to get us there. I cannot obviously do this work alone because I do not have the authority, nor do I have the knowledge. Uh, it is going to rely not just on each of you, but on, uh, on communities themselves who can bring the real experience <laughs> of this society to bear on solving these problems. And I wanna leave you all with a pledge to humbly rededicate myself and I hope you will do the same to this work, the work of building a more just community and the work of making America live up to its ideals and realize its potential. I look forward to your leadership and your partnership as we begin um, some very exciting uh, transformative work, a once in a lifetime opportunity to dismantle historically racist structures and to create the nation we want. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Executive Constantine. We appreciate your time. You are welcome to stay on and continue the conversation with us. Um, now that concludes our public comment portion, we have about 53 minutes left and we will now go back to item four on our agenda. As a reminder, the purpose of this meeting is to help us and the public understand King County Council's relationship and scope of authority with regard to the King County Sheriff's Office, to hear from communities that have been impacted by law enforcement, 
to hear their vision for a path forward and for us as elected officials to plan the bold steps we're willing to take to ensure that Black Lives Matter through policy. And so uh, I hope that the public comment portion provided a, a proper framing for all of us. I wanted to make sure that we heard directly from people experiencing harm because it's easy to get lost in the, the slogans and, and, and not actually listen for, for understanding. You know, when people say defund the police, they're not saying lawlessness and eliminate accountability. They're saying our current system is fundamentally flawed. Let's rethink public safety altogether in something that's rooted in community-based solutions and economic justice. And so hopefully we can talk through some of the ideas that we're willing to pursue on this line. We've heard what our levers are uh, from staff. They are available for questions uh, moving forward as well. But that's the, the framing that I wanted to provide as we begin this conversation. So I will open the floor to comments, uh, ideas from my colleagues. Uh, does anybody want to begin? Okay, I will uh, go ahead and begin then. One of the things that uh, people have called for is making sure that we have a housing first approach and repurposing certain King County buildings and land to providing housing for people who are not safe in, in our region. You know, we heard from people who are from the Black trans women community who uh, want a safe place to live. When, when we provide safe places to live, people can live safer lives. And that's an investment that we need to make. Um, is that something that people feel like we as a council and our executive can work on in terms of uh, eventually repurposing certain buildings that are using being used currently for COVID-19 once public health says that it's time that, that it's okay to use these for things other than COVID. Of course, we wouldn't make that determination. That would be our, our public health team. But is that something that we can work toward to providing more housing options for marginalized communities? Is that an investment that we are willing to make? Are you looking for kind of discussion and feedback? Yeah, discussion, people's, what, 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 essentially it's what you, from what you've heard from your constituents, from your communities, uh, what have you heard and what are you willing to, what kind of steps are you willing to commit to and have us as your team uh, work on with you? Oh, where to begin? <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, uh, if you want me to start just with the, I'll start by responding the, uh, um, I like the idea of making sure we're getting the best use possible out of county facilities. If they're located somewhere other than in, in King County, unincorporated King County, if they're located in a city, then I think that that's a, uh, we obviously want to respect their zoning and permitting and, and, and have them as, as partners in, in the work we do. I know that's a, a, a sensitive issue with our city partners. And uh, I think we have to be cognizant of that. Um, you know, the things I'm hearing probably aren't different than what all of my colleagues are hearing. I've been out, uh, uh, we had about 2000 folks gather in Kent yesterday, um, lifted up a lot of young voices. Um, we've, uh, we've had a lot of events and SeaTac will be uh, of a silent march tonight in Normandy Park. And there's a lot of energy uh, around the larger values that are being discussed around police accountability, institutional racism, our criminal justice system. And I think one of the biggest messages I'm hearing is it's easy for a lot of us to articulate problem statements. And it's easy for us to talk about values. And now we have to figure out what within our power can we change and accomplish and the areas that I'm interested in learning more about in this committee as we move forward, uh, really around Nick's opening presentation, what 
authorities do we have as a county council? Um, because it can get very frustrating. There's things that, that we might be interested in that have some limitations. So for example, um, a, the, our executive spoke to it, the need to have a stronger role for our Office of Law Enforcement Oversight. Um, we're fortunate to have a civilian Office of Law Enforcement Oversight, but they need independent investigation authority, they need subpoena power, and, and we need to listen to and implement their recommendations when they do issue reports. Um, but that's all subject to bargaining by the union. And state law also provides, if we reach an impasse, a lot of my friends will say, well, go bargain, be tough. And if the guild disagrees and we reach an impasse, state law sends it to an independent third party for what's called binding arbitration. Their decision is final. And given that they often look at comparables, it puts us at risk of maybe not even going, you could end up sliding backwards. So there are challenges in state law that, that are very that frustrate our ability to do it. Uh, that's one area I'd like to explore. As the executive said, how do we achieve stronger office of law enforcement oversight? One thing we can do is provide them more resources. I'd like to see us, even in this tough budget time, um, fund uh, a better level of staffing in that office so that they can be more effective in their work. I'm also interested in figuring out that question Nick talked about of what decision-making rests with an independently elected sheriff versus our role as policymakers uh, for the county and specifically things like the, the recommendations that we asked for the report on the other day uh, on how we investigate use of force incidents. If we end up in a situation where there is a disagreement between a majority of the county council and our sheriff in one area for any reason, where does the ultimate decision rest? Do we have the ability to pass an ordinance to change those policies? Likewise, policies relating to how the King County Sheriff's Office operates, what types of force are authorized, not authorized, and what circumstances. Um, are those solely within the decision of the elected sheriff? Or can we, as a policymaking body, set those policies? And I would say if our current structure gets in the way of our ability to represent our constituents in a democracy to set policies that reflect the values of the community, then we should look at changing that structure and perhaps go back to an appointed sheriff model um, if that is the only way to um, ensure that the voices of the people through their elected officials are heard. So those are some of the questions and the areas I'm interested in probing. I know that's rambling, but I wanted to at least sort of set the table with where my mind is going. And uh, there's a lot of work ahead and I'm excited that uh, this committee is gonna take it on. Thank you, council member up the Grove. Yeah, I, you know, I had a, right when um, the movements were starting to, uh, rise up in the past few weeks, I put out a pledge, a five point pledge showing that we should demilitarize the police, further restrict use of force, uh, increase accountability and transparency in police union contracts, give subpoena and other investigative powers to oversight boards and redirect funding toward community based alternatives. And that's the one, the fifth one, that's most people who have been most impacted by our criminal legal systems have been asking for. And, you know, as a policy, King County, as it moves forward through an equity and social justice framework, it's always about we should be fr framing our policies based on the people who are most negatively impacted by our systems. And that's the one that people are asking for. You know, we had public testimony today from someone who organized a 10,000-person 10, a 10, march. And in that 10,000-person march, he specifically asked uh, SPD not to show up because he had relationships with that community and was able to set up 
safety infrastructures uh, to make sure that people were safe. There were bicyclists out there managing traffic. There were people who do youth programming, who have relationships with the youth out there, who were trying to make good relationships with them and make sure they had a good experience. People were handing out water and, and food to one another. And in that 10,000 person march in South Seattle, there were no issues. There were no issues. Um, and that's the world that people are asking us to fight for. And so many of these community-based alternatives, the people who have relationships, the people who have experience and can promote public safety, they're the ones who are always who always have to go through the most rigorous process for funding. I think Council Member Balducci mentioned it in, in a uh, a few weeks back on a council hearing that uh, we, we have a very rigorous uh, funding process for human services and community uh, community organizations. And yet certain organizations like our police departments have dedicated funding year in, year out in the tens or hundreds of millions um, every single year. That's a broken system. That is a broken system and we should do something about that. And I hope that we can all move forward in a place where we have dedicated funding sources for the community-based solutions that keep us all safe. That's, that's the model that our community has been asking us for and that's what we should move toward. making space for anybody else to <laughs> hop in. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here, Mr. Chair. I don't have a, a lot of uh, outlined or specific thoughts, but I appreciated Council Member Up the Grove's remarks and, and join in those. And I wanted to thank uh, and extend appreciation to the County Executive for joining us today in really almost an unprecedented um, way, at least in my time on the Council, I think indicating the importance of the issue uh, in the special meeting that you've convened today. Um, I've, I've, um, been doing a lot of listening and, uh, challenging myself to keep an open mind, kind of like a brainstorming stage that, you know, no bad ideas to start, bring them all in. And let's really, really think about, uh, what our opportunities are that, that are here. Um, I have had some frustrations, I think, like a lot of you with some of the details on barriers to implementing some of the things that the voters have called for in terms of, Office of Law Enforcement Oversight. And, and I want to convey today that, uh, the, that that level of frustration, I really appreciated the public commenter who gave the analogy of the moldy house. <laughs> and um, when, when year after year, now approaching a decade, we get resistance at the bargaining table to just basic civilian oversight. Uh, as a lawyer, I have oversight. Teachers have oversight. Doctors have oversight. Politicians have oversight from independent boards, ethics commissions, public disclosure issues, and they're effective and they have the tools to do the work. It is getting increasingly difficult to continue to write the check every year into a, a system that is not representative of the community. I really believe that our law enforcement should be of, by, and for the community. Uh, that isn't its roots in America. <laughs> it was for people that looked like me. Frankly, it's original roots uh, in terms of the research I've done. Um, and some of, the, I think, the, the inequities and the bad practices uh, that, I, that appear sometimes are a result of that. But uh, I want to, again, thank the county executive. Uh, he, he announced in there or indicated in there a pretty a bold move to maybe go statewide and see if we could get some help in terms of, um, I would say, restoring and recentering um, the people and the public at large into some of these decisions and maybe in with respect to collective bargaining and oversight of law enforcement taking that out we have chosen as a state by law to put that on the table um and i'm exploring and interested in exploring with all of you ways to achieve that i just think it's a a basic premise our united states military reports to civilians <laughs> right um and i think that that should be a principle of perhaps anybody and any organization that's armed and under law can do grave bodily harm. Uh, as you know, I, I, along with a number of you, have introduced the, the appointed sheriff charter review commission recommendation. And one of the basic principles there is reporting uh, to civilians and the ability to implement policy from a broader perspective that Councilmember Up the Grove kind of talked about. 
So I'm interested in that reform. Um, on the scope of authority, I think one slight correction to Nick's very excellent report, we're getting to the details a little bit here, it was right, but the executive bargains, wages and benefits, but also civilian oversight under the charter. Uh, that is the one working condition that the council and the voters a couple of years ago in the amendment put over into the executive's hands. And, and we just have not made enough progress there. Um, I want to note that on the scope of authority, Councilman Ruffigo have talked about our ability and understanding better the contours of where we can uh, implement policy under our current model. But I think we should also bear in mind our police power to, uh, and, and it's not about police, but police power as lawmakers in the unincorporated area and whether we can pass laws that make it illegal to engage in certain conduct. You saw in, I think, New York, they outlawed uh, chokeholds uh, and other sorts of uh, life-threatening behaviors. And while we don't have police power countywide in our incorporated areas, we do in the unincorporated areas, and perhaps we should look at that. Uh, whether there are certain practices that we don't believe should remain legal as a matter of general law and act there in our capacity if we cannot achieve them through policy in the police department. I represent, uh, colleagues, as you know, three of the 17 cities, I think it's 17 in King County, that contract with the police, with the sheriff's office for police services, Woodenville, uh, Kenmore, and Shoreline. And I repeatedly hear very positive reports back but I want to surface today that I am also hearing from the elected leaders in those communities that they want a sheriff's department, a contracting party uh, that has appropriate civilian oversight, that has policies uh, that are contemporary and reflective of community needs. And they want us to act as a government to be able to deliver as a contracting party the very best police department to them because they can always look elsewhere or for or, or for their own. And I, I, I think it's important that you all know that and hear that and that those listening hear that. So I've made a number of other notes on potential ideas to work with you all. And I'm, I'm not sure I covered much there of, of substance, but I've appreciated you, Council Member Zahalai, and our conversations. And um, I, am, I, am, I am ready to make some big changes on budget lines if we don't <laughs> let me just say this if we don't have a department that warrants continued major investment in and also on the bigger picture of just shifting dollars to upstream you know i think um it's ironic and maybe wrong that we have to go for voter approval to fund housing to fund veterans to fund seniors to fund children <laughs> to um to fund all those needs, but not necessarily a law enforcement. And mm -hmm. uh, I am interested in, in seeing, taking a big picture approach as outlined by the accounting executive to see where we can make our, our investments work best. So thanks for the opportunity to just share a few words and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you, Council Member Dombowski. Mr. Chair. Council Member Colwells. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I really appreciate your holding this uh, meeting today of the Law and Justice Committee. And I'd like to talk about a few things. Um, we have a lot before us, of course. One is the, the current situation. It's probably not the best term, uh, but we have uh, a great many issues, I believe all uh, valid uh, with regard to law enforcement practices, um, crowd control tactics, uh, brutality, uh, murders of innocent uh, citizens. And the, these are taking place all over the country. I'm not singling out our law enforcement here, but certainly there have been significant numbers of cases in which people have been murdered uh, here by law enforcement. Uh, we also have uh, a lot of discussion and proposals floating around about reform proposals. And I really appreciate the chair's bringing out his uh, five point pledge. I'd like to sign on to that. Uh, and there are a lot of ideas going around, uh, including, and I think very importantly, having some shift to uh, community alternatives. But I think we have to look at all of those very carefully, which we do here at the council. 
very deliberatively. For example, there's a lot that's been discussed about Camden, New Jersey, and the very positive effects of uh, going away from a police department, uh, although it should be noted that there is a presence by and uh, a ability to have police uh, authority there through the county sheriff there. So it's all very complicated, but there is a third element here and that is funding. And it's been mentioned about our budget already. And I would like to just make sure our colleagues know that we have a lot of budgets coming up just about every month. There are restrictions on them, of course, but we just had transmitted the executive's third COVID budget, and it will be having a briefing on at our COW meeting next Tuesday. And we are hoping to have that passed by the council uh, at the following Tuesday meeting on the 23rd of June. And I will be getting out to you a process for, for provide to get your input on that with your priorities. Uh, we also, uh, and by the way, you already did give that, but in terms of any amendments of what we have received from the executive, we also have a third omnibus supplemental budget for the current biennium, and that will be transmitted next week uh, and taken up in July. We have uh, a fifth, a fourth COVID budget to be transmitted in August, a fifth COVID budget to be transmitted uh, in September, likely to be taken up uh, in December. We also have our biennial budget for 2020 and 2021, which will be transmitted late September, and we will work on uh, in the fall and uh, pass that later in November. So we have a lot of lot going on here, but we have a lot of opportunities as well. So I think that. Um, we take that into consideration as we look to have uh, reforms made as well as additions or changes to the budget. But we also have to remind ourselves, we have a pandemic going on. Our economy uh, has really been uh, tanking in many ways, and this is happening all over the country, but certainly here with our sales-based tax system, we are really hurting. So we have to determine very carefully reforms that we want to make uh, within the context of our budget framework. So again, thank you, Mr. Chair, for providing this opportunity. Thank you, Council Member Colwells. Lambert. Council Member Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's good to see you. Um, I'm looking forward to our other conversation soon. Um, first of all, I want to say that no one wants anybody to be mistreated. And I think that's a really good starting place where we can all agree to that. And then having a blank piece of paper to begin to talk about what we want. So I have thought long and hard about what we want. And so I'd like to share a few of those things like everybody else has. First of all, being a police person is a very difficult job. And I want to acknowledge that it's not an easy job. As you know, my dad was a policeman in a very large city. And so I got to see firsthand um, the idea of the compassion and the dedication of policemen who are doing a good job. So it's not a job I'd want. Um, and I, I think it's wonderful that we have people who are willing to serve. One of the things we tried to do two years ago was community policing. That is a model that I feel very strongly about. We had a study done on community policing and decided that we couldn't put the money into it. Community policing is working in many parts of my district and it is very successful. Pretty much what Dominique said a few minutes ago about the community being involved and sharing in a relationship, everything in life is about relationships and having people come together and get to know the people who are protecting their, their areas is really important. I see officers at 
kiwanas and rotaries and chambers and walking down the street and helping people and playing ball with the kids. That kind of policing helps people to feel free to talk to their officers. I was a school teacher, as you know, and we had a DARE officer in, in our class and in our school. And that was, while the program itself was not considered to be successful, what it was successful in was the fact that people got really good relationships with their officers and felt comfortable to say when they were having problems. And that was important. Radar, um, I was so glad that um, Brooke spoke earlier. Um, she's one of my heroes. Um, Brooke, I think I've told you that before. Um, Radar is an amazing program. Um, in the last budget, we tried to make it countywide um, and we're not successful because we didn't fund it. Um, but I think that is a really important program. We do not know when we get a 911 call exactly what's happening. Um, I myself have made 911 calls where I had a prowler in the house and I couldn't really give the information because I wasn't alone. So um, you don't know what you're going to until you get there. And so having an officer there that can evaluate what the scene is and then turn it over to radar. Um, through this pandemic, we are seeing a huge increase in domestic violence, which again, breaks my heart. And so we need a DV unit. We need somebody to go in and help. Um, and the DV calls, as we know, are the most dangerous of all calls. So I have three areas where I think we could jump in. Number one, breaking the cycle of poverty. That has got to be the root of what we do. And I have talked with our um, division chair about having contracts when we contract um, with human services to set a plan of how we are going to break the cycle of poverty with each and every person. He tells me that some of our contracts that we do with human services already include this. And I think we should have all of our contracts include this. This is what they do in Oklahoma and it has been very successful. Secondly, the court systems are too complicated. And if we're going to get a 20% increase coming back into the court system, we have got to simplify that system. And um, Mr. Chair, your staff and I and others met um, and walked through the system um, for domestic violence. And I think we both saw that it was very complicated. That will take some work with the state. We um, tried to set up a couple of years ago um, a master form where people of all different languages could um, be able to put into the computer in their language, which would populate the forms. Um, and that work was done as part of master plan forms. As far as, as public safety, we have to continue to monitor the um, the safety and the techniques that are used. The academy um, under Sue Roar has done different kinds of training. I have been down to the academy and gone through some of the segments of the, of the training. I think we need to look at the training and see if there are things that we think are missing or things that need to be emphasized. But I think to take away tools that are needed in certain kinds of emergencies is not fair to the general public. We may say that certain kinds of chokeholds we do not want to use, but in certain kinds of emergencies, as if a gun is shot, that we need to be um, doing a report on why that happened. But I think if we're going to ask people to step forward and be peacekeepers, law enforcement, we're going to have to make sure that they too are safe. And while I watched the um, television the other night and saw people standing and screaming into people's faces for hours and hours, um, that, is, that is not okay. We have to have a more civil society where everybody gets treated with respect. So I think the conversations going forward are going to be very important, but they need to be balanced. And in the end, we all need to be in this together. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member uh, Lambert. Balducci. Council Member Balducci. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thanks for uh, having us who are not on the committee here today and giving us an opportunity to speak. I don't wanna take up too much time because I, I wanna honor the committee's ability to work. 
but I wanted to say a few things if that's okay. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for your leadership in uh, bringing forward the motion we adopted. Was it just yesterday? Two days ago. <laughs> uh, and the testimony and, and organizing this meeting, this special meeting, uh, I want to just say the testimony that we heard today was really important. Um, I really want to acknowledge and honor the families who relive their trauma every time they talk about these issues, but they do it to advocate for a better future. I know that we all here have been listening and watching and reading a lot. Um, uh, some of us, you particularly, Mr. Chair, have been out uh, advocating. I've been listening a lot. Um, I've been trying to take in what people are saying in a different way uh, because I think the protesters are talking to us, to me, to leaders uh, who have the, uh, the responsibility to do everything in our power to make the changes that are being that are necessary. Um, I think it's important. We've been talking a lot about police uh, and law enforcement. I think it's important to make sure that we acknowledge that racial injustice and disproportionate experiences right here in King County span the gamut of experiences, not just involvement in the criminal justice system at every step along the way, but literally from birth to death, if you look at the public health studies and statistics that we've seen in King County, infant mortality, birth weight, education, employment, housing, transportation, wealth, health, life expectancy, every single step along the way, we see stark racial disproportionality and worse experiences for our black residents, indigenous residents and other people of color as well. Um, and when people say that this is systemic, just listening to us here at King County Council and the executive to talk about the changes we want to make and the systems that need to be navigated to make that change, I think is the absolute proof that the system protects itself and resists change. Public accountability for law enforcement is stymied by state law and contracts that we've negotiated over the years. Uh, we heard that providing housing for the most marginalized people in our communities is you know, subject to zoning and permitting. Those are systems that were set up and they are not, uh, they are not neutral systems. Funding and where funding has historically gone, the fact that we have had to at King County, and, and I'm proud of this, bend over backwards to create dedicated funding sources for human services, for health, for mental health. It's good that we've done that, but there's a system in place that forces us to have to do that while our most flexible routine money that we collect goes disproportionately to law enforcement. Um, and, these, and the funding that we have for those sort of community services are all subject to something called non-supplantation policy. It's a big word, which means that we can only use new funds for new things. So the services that we provide get squeezed. Our tax system uh, really binds our hands and it's regressive. It puts the most burden on people of color and poor people, and it leads to further austerity in the areas where we want to invest the most. So I just wanted to say those things because I think that we need to own, uh, we only sit in a part of the system, but we can't stay there. We have to work to advocate for things to happen in the entire system so that, the, uh, so that all of our levels of government can be more supportive um, and do, do more of the right things. Uh, you asked some questions, Mr. Chair, I want to answer them. You asked, should we repurpose prop county property to community needs? My answer to that is yes, I think we absolutely should. Whether those are properties we own now or others, I support that. We do, and uh, the, the, just saying yes isn't enough. We do have to work with our communities and, and make a plan and work with the jurisdictions that they sit in, but we should do that. We should do that. Um, you asked uh, if we should defund the police. I truthfully, I feel a little awkward talking about defunding the police because I think that the people who are advocating for it may mean something different than what I am hearing when I hear defund the police. I want to suggest that we engage in a process similar to what the Seattle Council has proposed. They're calling it an inquest where they're going to do a very deep dive into where the money goes in law enforcement and what it's for and then ask whether there should be changes. I think we should do the same. Um, you asked uh, by virtue of mentioning your five point plan, which I think is a really really neat um, thought process. Should we demilitarize the police? Yes, I believe we should do that. Um, we have a, one of the good traditions in our country is not having military in the streets routinely acting against civilians. And we shouldn't 
end run that, if you will, by substituting a militarized local law enforcement to do that. Um, there's a list of reforms we should work on. I've been receiving them. I've been tracking them. I've got almost 40 items that we've heard from different people. I would love to share those with you and see if we can find a way to pull out the things we can do quickly and in our own authority, and then move forward together to work on the things that we can't do as quickly or that we need help from other levels of government, but we should put together a plan based on uh, this list of really good ideas that are coming in from the community and from others. So there's a lot more to say, but thank you for the opportunity to just download some of my thoughts like this today. Thank you so much, Council Member Balducci. I would also like to give space for the OLEO director or OLEO department or the sheriff's office if they would like some time to uh, speak on the things that they've heard today. Go okay. Good afternoon, Council. I'm uh, glad to speak for a few moments if you have the time, Mr. Chair. Absolutely, Sheriff. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to thank everybody that's uh, been on this Zoom uh, hearing today and, and the time that everybody's taken to do it. I've been uh, listening to the entire conversation today and doing a lot of listening lately. And I want to make sure that everyone here and as much as possible um, knows that um, I'm hearing, I'm listening, I'm paying attention and working cooperatively with uh, just as recently as yesterday with the King County Police Officers Guild and talking about uh, some uh, agreements that we have. Uh, many of you might have heard about it, but out of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, eight can't wait. And our policy is very close to meeting each and every one of those eight items. And, uh, but I do want to acknowledge to everybody here today that I myself and the members of my organization um, are appalled by what happened in Minneapolis and remain appalled when members of law enforcement take actions that are illegal. And, and commit crimes. And we will continue to call out um, those folks when those occur. I apologize to the, the communities and families of color who have had to go through this in their lifetime. And as you may know, recently had that opportunity in person or, or via Zoom to talk to um, Mr. Gittens and Ms. Dunlap and express uh, my apology to them, the loss of their son. Having said that, there are things that we are constantly doing in the sheriff's office as it relates to policy and improving policy and making sure that our policy is in alignment with federal, state, and local law. Um, the, the eight can't wait pieces that I'm talking about are things we do not um, allow uh, what is a chokehold or in uh, parlance of use as use the first tool called a lateral neck restraint. This is not allowed in our use of force policy. It will not continue not to be allowed as long as I'm sheriff in our use of force policy. And we're tweaking our policy a bit with the help of uh, King County Police, or I'm sorry, with the uh, King County Police Officers Guild to define it even more clearly in policy that it is a, a use of deadly force if applied, much like any other, um, I, I think yesterday we were talking about this in King County Police Chiefs and we talked about, um, uh, you know, whether it's whatever tool you use in that moment in the application, I consider that use of deadly force and it would be investigated as such. So um, anyway, I wanted to share that piece with you. I got an opportunity last night to talk to the county executive um, for the first time in a, in a while. And there are places that we, we see eye to eye in our ability to come together and discuss um, opportunities and opportunities with you all as well. As, as you know, there have been some things that we have done in regards to training that we have moved ahead of where we are in the rest of the state and some of the trainings we've used, but this is not, uh, I, I don't wanna take a lot of time 
and appear tone deaf to the messages that are being sent to me today by community. And so I'll end my comments with, we believe in oversight. Uh, we believe in that process. We have just put forward facing on our internet page, dashboards on the last six years of our use of force. Uh, I sent an email to, to all the council members uh, and the executive yesterday, as well as advertised it to the community. So we are the second agency in the state of Washington, one of the few across the country that are, are doing this. And so I look forward to working with you uh, individually in committee meetings with our staff work, as well as the county executive and finding ways um, where we, we can uh, work more closely together uh, as it relates to law enforcement of the sh that the sheriff's office provides. The final thing I'd like to say, I'm really glad that my conversation with the executive yesterday, I, I used the term that was my goal when I ran for re-election was reimagining policing. So I'm glad that and appreciate that he was able to co-opt that to help form and share kind of where we both are with this. So thank you for your time today, Mr. Chair. Return floor back to you, sir. Thank you so much, Sheriff Joe Hagnick. Um, does anyone from uh, the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight want to uh, share any thoughts in, for a few minutes? Yes, hello, thank you. For those who don't know me, I'm Deborah Jacobs, Director of the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight. I would like to briefly thank the people who spoke on the call today, particularly the community members who <clears throat> expressed their experiences and what they've learned from them and what we can use to uh, make a paradigm shift. And also so many thanks to King County Executive Dow Constantine and all the council members who have been thinking and listening and, um, and open to taking risks to make the change that is so obvious we are all yearning for. Um, I think a really, I'm grateful for this and future meetings that I know will be addressing this issue. I think a really critical piece of our next uh, stage of conversation would be a community and stakeholder dialogue on independent investigations and what that might look like for the King County Sheriff's Office. I'm developing some options that the council might want to delve into and hear public opinion on and think about as we move into the next phase of our development. As we all know, it needs to be bargained. And I, my, I just can't tell you how, I'm great, how grateful I am to Executive Constantine for taking on the commitment of leading the charge to work on exempting oversight from the collective bargaining process. Although that's only just the first step of what needs to be done because there are accountability issues blocked by collective bargaining that don't have to do with oversight as well. When I think about a par paradigm shift, I'm happy that the sheriff's office is thinking about it and getting more transparency, getting some information up on their website um, at this time. But I can't help but note what, when there's a meeting about use of force policies with the police officers guild, but not with Olio, that's the kind of paradigm shift we really need as well. And um, I think all policy uh, conversations that um, could have outcomes that affect people's health and safety are things that the oversight office should be among the first at the table on. So I'll note that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director Jacobs. Appreciate your time. Do any other council members have any comments, anything they want to share before we sure. wrap up? Councilmember McDermott. Councilmember McDermott. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chair, as others have said, for um, your work in convening um, this meeting and um, this open conversation about the issues that are facing our local community and our country. Um, I'm going to try to, um, I, I think my colleagues um, have outlined a number of the issues that we're facing um, as we, we see protests and outrage about um, Black Lives Matter and the response in communities really stepping up to address racism and to not just um, talk about it, but transform each of us into anti-racists. Um, I'm glad to be engaged in some of the um, immediate work before the council 
um, with you co-sponsoring the charter amendments for inquests and for subpoena power for the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight. There's concrete steps like that that we need to take on. But I think the more transformative work, transformational work that I am called to do, and, and I suggest all of us are called to do as policymakers, is to, to be goal oriented and to not be bound by traditional limits or roles or procedures. Um, for instance, we heard in um, public comment at the beginning of this meeting from um, trans women of color and uh, about their negative in, um, interactions with police and the tragic outcomes, the deaths in, in that community in particular, the need for housing. It might not be seen as a traditional role of county government to provide housing, particularly for trans women of color. But I suggest that's the kind of transformational goal-oriented work we need to do, breaking free of existing rules and procedures and expectations um, to take on the work before us. And I look forward to joining with all of you um, in challenging ourselves to take on the work that the community is um, so rightfully demanding. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Council Member McDermott. Uh, was, did somebody just say something? Yeah. Council Member Lambert, please go ahead. Just for the record, I wanted to say that I, I too approve the minutes of the two meetings um, that um, were before us before I got on, on the line, um, February 11th and 25th. Absolutely. Um, Madam Clerk, can we make sure we reflect that? Certainly, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, thank you, Council Member McDermott. That was just a great framing for us to wrap things up on. All around our country in the past few weeks, and of course, decades and centuries, we have seen Black organizers build a movement on the scale of which we haven't seen in a long time. We've seen locally and nationally pr pr protests of tens of thousands of people rising up and demanding justice. And it's our job as elected officials to translate that energy, this unprecedented energy into bold action, as bold as we can. What we're hearing from uh, people is not that they want more oversight. They want a new system of public safety. And so if there was ever a time to get bold and to do things that we've never done before, it's, it's right now. And I hope that we will do that. I've been taking notes as each of you have been talking, and I'm so grateful for the concrete policy proposals that you have all been saying. Uh, this has not been a conversation of just stating values, but you have all actually put forward uh, some pretty great and powerful things. And our team will go ahead and start proposing ordinances and working with you collaboratively to do things that we've never done before. Primarily, I heard about uh, an inquest process so we can actually look critically at our budget, primarily our King County Sheriff's Office, to see how we can repurpose our funds to create this new system of public safety rooted in community alternatives and economic justice, uh, transferring land to people who have been harmed and making sure that they're able to keep their own community safe. I've heard uh, you all talking about demilitarizing and we'll, we'll take an account of the military equipment that's out there and making sure that we're working to get rid of it. I've heard you all talk about uh, creating alternatives to policing, uh, mental health crisis responders, social workers, youth mentors, and program managers. These are all things that we need to invest in so that we have communities keeping communities safe. Those are the things that we heard uh, from everyone today, and I hope that we can all work collaboratively to put forward ordinances and proposals and work with uh, the King County Executive, who has also shared bold plans uh, for moving forward. Um, I thought this was a really productive conversation. It won't be the last time. Thank you, uh, Council Chair Balducci, for bringing law and justice back so that we can get to work. Um, I'm really excited to work on all these plans with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And with nothing, with no other items on the agenda, our Law and Justice Committee is now over. Thank you so much. Thank you.